Well, I'm thrilled to be back here again uh, this year. Uh, last year was such a joy to be here as well. And so tonight I'm going to talk about amber and honey. And amber is, has worldwide distribution. These uh, dots show where the major deposits are located. And one of the principal ones, uh, considered probably the second finest, is in the Dominican Republic there. And you'll see that there are beautifully different colored types of amber that are found there, even with these very unusual colors here, uh, with the blues and the greens as well. And you see these inclusions of uh, plant parts or animal parts. And then down in Mexico, they're also in the state of Chiapas, these brightly colored, highly varied uh, specimens of amber there as well. And there are even two locations up in uh, Canada with this dark, deep uh, blood red color to the amber uh, that's located there. And in Burma is distinguished for having amber specimens with inclusions of species of plants and animals that are found nowhere else in the world. And so here are a couple of examples of that. And in particular, this one is very, anxious, uh, very interesting. This is a, a frog specimen. And it's kind of hard to tell it apart from the beetle that it was caught in the act of praying when it became encased in the uh, amber. Uh, but here they did CT scans, and now you can see clearly uh, the jaw and the uh, forelimbs of the frog. And then even in more detail as they rotate it around to see so it's very interesting to see what is uh, caught into these uh, specimens. Then uh, the newest discovery where you see the red dot there in that northern uh, extension of the peninsula in Australia uh, is on the shore there in about 2002 uh, they began washing out specimens of amber uh, from the ocean. And one of the most unusual specimens is this type of beetle here and that's not been cut off, that's its actual uh, intact anatomical shape. It's just rather unusual. Kind of reminds you of something out of Star Wars or something. <laughs> Along with more usual specimens that you see here uh, and these types of things. And then the premier location for amber uh, is uh, on the shores of the Baltic, especially in this area here uh, outlined in the red line, that is a portion of Russia that is not contiguous with the rest of the country because the Baltic states are separated from the main part of Russia. Here's a close-up of this area, and then as you get even closer here, this is the town of Yantar, which is uh, the name for amber in the Russian language. And this is, the visit to this place is what sparked my interest in this talk about oh, some 12 years ago when I was there uh, on a mission trip. And so here's the Baltic coast uh, looking westward. And then right there is this huge uh, amber mine where there is this deposit that they call blue earth. And uh, you can see that it indeed has a pretty strong blue tinge to it. And this is not a delicate operation. <laughs> They're using uh, large-scale machinery here and are you know, scooping it up in large chunks and then um, separating it from the uh, burden, overburden there. And this particular uh, structure here is on pontoons. They lift it up with the crane, move it around, and then mine under that area as well. As you can see, they move things around. and uh, It's a major industry here. Uh, and then uh, you can just see further deposits as we move along. And then at the Visitor's Overlook Center there, then they have a little place there where they salt this area there with pieces so that children can scoop it out and, you know, quote, dig up their own little piece of amber. Here's the museum uh, with the building uh, in the town of Yantar. And I'd like to give you just a little bit of history here. It's rather fascinating. This is a map of Europe, this portion of Europe, in the year 1700. And at this time, uh, Frederick I, uh, who ruled over Prussia and the Brandenburg uh, Principality, formed an alliance with uh, Peter the Great, Peter I of Russia, uh, because much of the coast of the Baltic was under Swedish dominion under uh, King Charles. And so Peter wanted to get his window on the west. He wanted to get that coastal region where the Neva River empties into the Baltic. And um, 
Frederick I wanted to uh, push the Swedes back, so they formed an alliance, had a happy little war, and they both got what they wanted. Well, as thanks for this, uh, Frederick I uh, took from his palace amber that lined a room in the palace and gave it to Peter the Great. And so initially it was placed in this palace here in St. Petersburg, which was the newly built uh, palace in this newly reclaimed marsh land. Uh, the city was built from nothing, from the uh, bogs and marshes, canals were dug and the land was drained and structures were built. But then uh, later uh, in the uh, century, the um, collection of the amber in the room was then moved to a, to a palace called the Catherine Palace, built by an empress uh, who, who succeeded Peter a few generations later. And you can see the scale, these buildings are monstrous. And then built in this uh, one room where then the amber was in place to there. Well, along comes, uh, you know, uh, about 180 years later, uh, World War II, and the Germans then occupy this portion of Russia and reduce the palace to this rubble. But before they got there, the uh, curators of the museum attempted to paper over the amber because when they first tried to remove it, it, it was too crumbly. So they tried to paper over it and fool the Germans, but that didn't work. So before the Germans uh, reduced the palace to rubble, they removed all of the amber, placed it in 30 large wooden crates and shipped it out of the country. So here's an interior view of what happened to that palace. You can see the destruction was very severe. Well, at the time of World War II, um, this region here had been, was, had been historically Prussia and German-speaking and populated by German-speaking peoples. But then as the uh, tide of the war changed, uh, the composition of the population changed also. But still, while it was in German hands, there is a city then called Königsberg, and in this large structure is where the amber was stored. And then, of course, as things went on in the war, it was bombed into smithereens, and that's the palace in that condition. And so the question is, what happened to that amber? Nobody knows for sure. Either it's uh, on, uh, bombed into smithereens, or whether it's placed on a ship that maybe got sunk uh, in the Baltic Sea, or maybe it was successfully uh, pirated into Germany and very successfully hidden. Uh, not sure. Only two treasures from that room, two pieces, uh, have been uh, found and located uh, in the possession of a son of one of the officers uh, from the wartime and then had been returned uh, to uh, Russia in a uh, solemn ceremony in the year 2000. Well, after the war, uh, the palace was rebuilt, so this is its current uh, appearance and condition. And then the uh, room was rebuilt. They did have the architectural plans. Uh, of course, it was not the same amber, but uh, the good idea of what the room had been like historically. So can you imagine how many tens of millions of dollars this one room is worth with this tremendous wealth in amber? So the question is, when and how did amber form? Well, according to the secular scientists, anywhere from 15 to 220 million years ago, but these are arbitrary guesstimates at the best. Um, they really have no way of determining this for sure. So as we look at specimens, uh, we see you know, inclusions such as plant and animal material. And here's a quote from a secular uh, scientist uh, wh whose name is Gotelp, and he says, it's difficult to date amber directly, and the researchers are searching for the original rock deposits that would have contained the amber to date it. Well, uh, there are no original uh, rock uh, deposits per se, but this is the uh, citation for this. This was published in uh, 2006. Well, so there's a question about the dates and a question about the mechanism because the evolutionists among themselves cannot agree on timing or on mechanism. The most commonly given story is that something wounds a tree and so some of the sap flows out and an animal or plant part either blows onto it, crawls onto it, or falls into it. 
and then somehow it becomes encased. So here are some examples which this could possibly be a plausible story, such as this plant material here, or even these very, very tiny flowers which are extinct, or even these terrestrial insects. You can say, okay, it's reasonable. They crawled or flew uh, into the sap and got caught, and then it became amber afterwards. But here's this interesting uh, situation with this flea, and then with uh, careful investigation, they were able to culture out these bacteria from the proboscis of the flea. And it is the organism we know as Yersinia pestis, and this is the very same organism that caused the bubonic plague. Okay, and so they're able to culture this thing out live from the specimen from within the amber. So it does not, does that not give you doubt about this being tens of millions of years old? Well, we have other situations where here's a pretty good sized feather from a bird. Okay, now how does the whole feather get encased inside of amber? And in this feather, there is a mite there that, you know, these small things that you don't want crawling around on you. Well, there are even larger organisms such as scorpions and frogs that could possibly have climbed up onto the tree to become trapped in the sticky stuff. But now we're talking about larger things, lizards. Okay, now it's getting pretty hard to explain a whole lizard getting encased in this stuff. Well, interestingly, even fossil termites that are supposed to be at least 20 million years old, and they've been able to culture out the organisms that live in the gut of the termite. Still living organisms. <laughs> That's Russian for be healthy. <laughs> and so there are many, many generations of these organisms, but yet no evolution. Same organisms. Well, okay, so we've been talking about terrestrial organisms, but what about freshwater organisms that are found in amber? I don't believe they crawled out of the streams or rivers and to get up the tree and to get encased. So here we have a water beetle or a water strider. We also have uh, freshwater riffle beetles and snails. Hmm, this is getting a little more difficult to explain. And then here is the killer. What about marine organisms found in amber, such as barnacles? Hmm, how about isopods? Isopods are very small, tiny crustaceans that are part of what make up krill that, you know, what the whales filter through in the ocean for their feed. How about crabs? Marine crabs. How about marine snails? How about red algae that grows on the seafloor? Now, how did that get in amber? Don't think that crawled up the tree or blew into it. How about a trilobite? Okay, now it's getting pretty astounding, isn't it? How about an ammonite in the bottom right portion of the screen there, as well as mites, spiders, millipedes, beetles, cockroaches, flies, wasps, and marine gastropods, snails. Now, these things all don't live together, do they? They live in different environments, different ecologies. And yet they, here they're all mixed up in the very same specimen. It's getting to be quite a stretch now, isn't it? How about air bubbles in amber? How does that happen on a tree? Well, one of the ways to try to explain away some of these air bubbles is saying that the gas formed by decomposition of the organism. That might work possibly, maybe kind of, sort of, for that specimen, but how about here? Multiple bubbles. Many, several hundreds of these bubbles have been uh, examined and have been uh, measured for the air content in the bubbles. And interestingly, it's been found that the oxygen concentration is about 32 to 36 percent. 
And today, room air oxygen is what percentage? 21. 21. Many of you know that. Uh, so much higher, much higher oxygen concentration. Uh, this you makes you wonder if, if, if the pre-flood uh, atmosphere had higher levels of oxygen and CO2 than today. Uh, it's something that's tantalizing to think about, although Dr. Jonathan Sarfaji has said, oh, don't put a whole lot of weight in that um, for uh, some reasons that um, I don't know yet. But here is a real interesting thing. How about an air bubble inside water inside amber? Now, if you compare the position of the air bubble in those upper and lower uh, views there, you can see with the red arrow that the air bubble shifts inside the water, inside the amber, just like the air bubble on a carpenter's uh, level. Okay, isn't that rather astounding? Very interesting. Well, here's an article written about gas bubbles and fossil amber as possible uh, indications of gas composition of ancient air. Now, ancient air from the secular point of view, you know, as a creationist, we would say pre-flood atmosphere. Well, I just want to take you on a short rabbit trail here, looking at the difference in the world before and after the flood. This is a chart showing distribution of carbon and in these, these units, each unit is a billion tons. So number one means a billion tons. So for example, for Pete there, that's 500 billion tons of carbon. But the huge number here with the carbon and precipitates refers to carbon that's locked up in rock, you know, calcium carbonate and other uh, forms of uh, uh, carbonates. Uh, and so this is humongous amount. So I think this tells us that a tremendous amount of carbon and oxygen that was in circulation in the biomass in the living organisms, plants and animals prior to the flood, then subsequently became locked up either in rock or in oil, uh, gas, uh, those types of things. And so it's very possible that the barometric pressure of the atmosphere prior to the flood was significantly higher than today, providing enough lift for these huge organisms to be able to fly. Uh, so here we see these flying reptiles, uh, some of which are as tall or taller than a giraffe. You know, they would need quite a bit of lift to be able to uh, fly. Or the dragonfly with a 30-inch wingspan. Uh, we have a fossil of that. Uh, so it's just an interesting side thought. Um, to uh, consider as you look at these bubbles inside these specimens of amber. Well, there's some work done by two secular scientists, uh, Alexander Schmidt of the Museum of Natural History in Berlin and David Dilcher from the University of Florida. And they came up with an ingenious thought, uh, which is that working in the swamps of Florida there, they said, well, why don't we wound some trees? They got permission first and then see what happens when the sap runs into the water and see the results of that. So there is your carpenter wounding the trees uh, so that the sap would run into the water. And they found that water delays the process of solidification that's normally driven by oxygen in the air. So this makes sense. Uh, and they noticed then that the resin stays stickier longer underwater and is more likely to trap organisms. Hmm, this seems like a real nice explanation here for all the things that I've shown you so far. So can you think of an event that would rip up millions or billions or trillions or gazillions of trees worldwide causing them to leak sap into water? What might you think of? Noah's flood, right? Yeah. So here you see uh, the results of one of the hurricanes going through Florida, you know, causing tremendous destruction. But that's compared to the worldwide scale of Noah's flood, that's just a dinky little thing, not to minimize all the problems that it caused for people. So in their study, the tree resin did not solidify. 
but it did take uh, much longer to become stickier and had a lot more time to flow and to surround these various organisms from all these various uh, ecological areas, fresh water, salt water, as well as the terrestrial uh, environments. But they do say that it might have turned to solid amber if the pond water level fell and given enough protection by layers of sediment would then be able to solidify. Can you think of a place where you can see many, many such layers of sediment? Famous place. Oh, you mean that? Yeah, the Grand Canyon. We're very fortunate just to live a few hours from the Grand Canyon and take students there every year on field trips and show them how God did things. So yes, the Grand Canyon is a great example of these layers of sediment, which would then provide uh, the pressure and uh, heat for the amber then to solidify. Now, of course, from their secular point of view, they say survive intact for millions of years, but we know that many things, the formation of opals, diamonds, coal, don't need lots of time. They just need lots of energy in a short amount of time. So again, the event that would lay down those layers of sediment and have water coming and going like this, uh, here are a series of diagrams uh, that have been worked out uh, by folks uh, working today with uh, cores of uh, drilling in rock layers, oil wells, water wells, uh, where cuts have been made in, for roads and things. And they're putting together a map uh, showing how they can, they can develop a real good feel for how water was moving around and ebbing and flowing and then going up and coming down, and going up higher and coming down and going up higher yet around the flood as they tackle each uh, continent in turn. And so this would be a very good picture of, of what was going on during the year-long flood process. So water immersion is necessary for amber to have time to flow and into encase organisms to capture marine and freshwater animals since they're not crawling up the trees to occur on a worldwide basis and so the simple explanation for all of this as you've seen here you know it's not morning <laughs> it's not been too long since my wife and I came from uh, Europe we're still in the wrong time zone uh, <laughs> So in Genesis 7:11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So here is an illustration from Walt Brown's book in the beginning uh, with that high pressure causing water to shoot up significantly and then to come down and to begin to inundate uh, the earth. And then we have further on in Genesis, now the flood was on the earth 40 days, the waters increased and lifted up the ark and it rose high above the earth. Waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. No series of local floods as the secular guys would like to say. So here is one artist's rendition of the uh, ark as it may have appeared. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, the mountains were covered, all flesh died, every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath, all was on the dry land, died. Okay, so what part of all do people not get? All right, so we're trying to understand just how extremely violent the flood process was. Uh, there are just so many violent processes as part of the total picture. Underwater volcanoes erupting. This is a picture of a modern underwater submarine volcano. Uh, huge landslides, except I should say marine slides, underwater movement of huge parts of the seafloor. Uh, this covers uh, three degrees of the um, circumference of the earth. We're talking huge surface areas. Um, tsunamis because of the earthquakes caused by these marine slides. Uh, tremendous thing, destroying all living things destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. It's pretty clear there. 
And so things were going on even after the flood. Huge hurricanes were going on during the flood and after they're calculated to be a hundred times the size of modern hurricanes, as if those were not bad enough. Uh, huge things such as this. And so uh, the ark is a picture of Christ, going back to the word ark itself. So in Genesis, you know, there was the command there given to Noah, make yourself an ark of gopher wood make rooms in the ark, cover it inside and outside with pitch. And then the dimensions are given. Well, we also have that very same Hebrew word used for ark when it comes to the uh, situation with Moses. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes, daubed it with asphalt and pitch. The very same words as for the ark of the flood. And it's the same thing. It's this idea of this uh, object to be floating on the water to contain something very precious. So here's an artist's depiction of this, these bulrushes made to make this container with pitch to then contain uh, Moses. Then he said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, which you will eat, nor about the body, which you will put on. Well, people do make beautiful objects out of amber to put on. Um, very gorgeous things, but the true jewels and the arcs of Noah and Moses and Christ are the souls that they contain, of those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ as our Creator, Savior, and Redeemer. So now I would like to tie this together with bees, because here we have a bee in amber. And so let's take a look at how bees in amber cause evolutionist headaches. Well, here is a quote from a secular source. Uh, bees have probably changed very little in the last 80 million years. Well, as creationists, we know there weren't 80 million years to have them to change in. But here's another killer of a fossil. There's supposed to be um, no bees before flowers, right? Because how can bees survive without flowers, without sources of nectar and without sources of pollen? So here we have a fossil uh, found in uh, Arizona in the Petrified uh, National Monument where there are uh, bee combs found in rock that according to the evolutionists is 100 million years before flowering plants were supposed to have shown up. This is a major problem. So we can say, I mean business. Oops, I hit too many. <laughs> too much emphasis. Let's try one more time. I mean business. So let's get down to business. All right? So how do bees use their senses to find nectar and pollen? In other words, how do they taste, detect odors? They use their feet. How would you like to use your feet to smell? I mean, smelly feet. No, no, feet to smell. Which is it? All right, so you see here, they do have some sensory, uh, odor sensory uh, ability with their in, uh, antenna. They do have their mouth parts for eating. Then there's the portion of the uh, leg, the feet, called the tarsus. And here is the tarsus that we have. The colored bones there collectively are the tarsus. There's the uh, calcaneus, which we call the heel bone, and the other various bones, navicular, and uh, tarsals, etc. So that is where the sensory organs are placed. And here is a diagram of one individual sensory organ with the pores where the molecules that are conveying the odor uh, are then taken into that cell and then the nerves uh, then transmit that uh, changed signal from a molecule to an electrical signal and then it goes to the bee's brain and says, aha, here's something we want. And here is an electron uh, micrograph, electron photograph of these structures here that are on the foot of the bee. And at this point in time, uh, nothing has been found in the way of these uh, receptors that pick up bitter substances. Um, and it is important to note that they mainly pick up the, the things that are good, sweet. And 
this is important because molecules that are bitter are usually the ones that are bad for us. Uh, and so here in, in East uh, Arizona, in the Southwest, uh, we have a plant called oleander, uh, very commonly planted in that area, and it has this toxin called oleandrin, which is in every part of the plant, the flower, the nectar, the leaf, the stems. The stems are very straight, very long, and great to put a marshmallow or a hot dog on for a weenie roast. But you don't want to do that because then you'll get poisoned. I've actually had to treat patients for this. So bees avoid this so that they don't make honey that has the toxin in it. So they, so they have the sense to stay away from the things that are toxins and to stay with the plants that have the uh, positive beneficial molecules in them. Now I say landing strips here because some of these flowers actually have physical landing strips for the bees to land on as they approach to take the nectar or the pollen. How accommodating of the plant. Well, uh, here I want you to pay note to these three little organs on the forehead of the bee, circled in red, and those are called uh, ocelli, or one ocellum, uh, and this is only for picking up motion, not for actually seeing an image, but just to, de to detect motion. So that if something such as a bird is coming at them to try and eat them, they'll be able to detect that and evade the predator. Uh, as opposed to the omatidium, which is one, just one lens and a compound eye. So these are two very totally different structures. And there you can see in the right hand part of that, that these Hundreds, if not thousands, of these omatidia together form the compound eye. Well, here is the range of vision for a human. We can see from here to here 190 degrees, uh, combining our two eyes as we're looking straight uh, forward ahead. We can see 190 degrees. The bee, with those big bulging eyes on the sides of their head, as opposed to our eyes being in the front of the head, can see this huge 280 degree range. Phenomenal. And so here we see the close-up getting more close and closer yet with magnification. And finally here we're looking at those individual omatidia, the each indivi individual lens that makes up the compound eye. And so here you see in diagrammatic form how they each have their own lens and then have the cone and then the muscle, rhabdom, uh, and then, uh, meaning rod, I'm sorry, not muscle, but rod, and then the photoreceptor, which then converts it from light to chemical to electrical signal to be combined with the other omatidia then to make an image in the bee's brain. Well, what do bees see? You see there with the black bars that bees see much more to the blue end of the spectrum. They don't see red uh, well, uh, if at all, and they see ultraviolet, which we do not see. Uh, they don't have the red photoreceptors, and so they, they have a different range of vision. And so this is showing you the flower that we see. It, it looks yellow to us, but to the bee, that's what it looks like on the right. And notice the markings that show up that we do not see. Do you think maybe God put some signs there for the bees to say, oh yeah, come here, all right? And here's another example. <clears throat> Same flower, invisible light versus ultraviolet light. So you can see they have a very different world that they're looking at than we do. And here's another example here. What we see and what the bee sees. <clears throat> and then here are some more examples as well. So these are ways to make sure the bees are aware of where their sources of nectar and pollen are located. Well, how about plants listening to bees? You say, what, have I lost? Have I gotten off my rocker? Have I, you know, have I leave my brain on the other side of the ocean? Well, it turns out that the vibration caused by the very rapid beating of the wings of the bees is at the right frequency sensed by 
plants. Not only that, the plants respond to it by increasing the concentration of the sugar in the nectar and react quickly, sweetening the nectar in less than three minutes. Is that not astounding? Just amazing. Not only that, the plants, they, the plants, respond to these vibrations by, uh, that, that are moving through their tissues and they can release pollen only when the insects land on them and buzz at the right frequency so that the pollen is not lost when the bee is not present. Wow. And notice here, pollen is all over this bee. She is pollinated. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> now here's another astounding thing which more people may be aware of, is that bees are able to navigate pr very purposefully and they're able to measure the angle between the sun, the direction of the hive to the sun and from the hive to the source of pollen and nectar. And so here is a diagram showing that there are 30 degrees. And so they go back to the hive and using gravity and a vertical line as the sun, then they reproduce that angle to the field, to the source of pollen or nectar. And so they uh, do this waggle dance. And so on this line that's at the angle that would be pointing towards the source of pollen or nectar, they rapidly waggle their abdomen and the speed at which they waggle the abdomen indicates distance and the angle d uh, indicates direction so this means that particular source is in the direction opposite the sun and so the bees surrounding her are then uh, checking out because remember this happens in a pitch black hive they don't have light in there. So they gather around and sense this to get the distance and the direction and then also they may get samples from the bee regurgitating so that they know what they're going after. And of course you can see the pollen in the sacks there, the yellow uh, collections there. So I'd like to know how this evolved. You know, of course we know it did not. It's very much a created system. Yeah. Is this not astounding? Yeah. All right. Well, what happens when it gets cloudy and they can't see the sun? Well, the bees are able to sense the direction of the light, the polarization of light. You know, we use polarized filters on our cameras to remove haze and things. Well, bees can sense a polarization of light. So when the clouds come rolling in, they can't see the sun, but they can still sense the polarization so they know where the sun is hidden behind the clouds. Well, this happens because of the way God constructed the compound eye so that some of the Photoreceptors are at 90 degrees to others. So with that construction, they, the bees can then detect the direction of the polarization of the light and still go about their business. Now I have to tell you though, uh, when I was a teenager, my dad and I uh, kept bees. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, on a cloudy day, they did get grouchy. <laughs> and we would feel it. So, okay, here's a question for you. Do bees have hairy eyeballs? Do bees have hairy eyeballs? The answer is yes. All right. And you say, what in the heck is this for? Well, it is thought, it's not conclusively proven, but it is thought that this serves as a wind detection mechanism so that the bees can compensate for being blown off course to get back on course to the goal to get to the pollen or the nectar. Is that not amazing also? And that's the explanation why. Here's another astounding thing is that 
Here you have what's called the traveling salesman problem. You have all these various flowers to get to. And so what's the most efficient way, efficient way to get to the flowers without unnecessarily retracing and duplicating your course back and forth? Well, some scientists were able to put, attach an extremely small uh, detector uh, tracker on a bumblebee. They used a bumblebee because it's much bigger than a honeybee and could handle the weight of the, of the mechanism. And the bumblebee solved the problem correctly. So they know how to figure this, figure this out. So they solve the traveling salesman problem. Honeybees do the same thing. Computers could not find better results. So how in the world do bees do this with those minuscule brains? It's not by random chance, trial and error. It's by designed systems. Okay, here's another crazy thing while we're talking about math is bees do appear to able to comprehend the concept of zero. What do you say, what are you, what are you talking about here? Well, some researchers would train bees with enticing them with you know, some sugar source to go to the uh, piece of paper that had fewer dots than other pieces of paper. And so they gradually worked their way down to zero and if there was a choice between one and zero, the bee went to zero without the honey as a draw. Amazing, absolutely amazing. So they understood this concept of less than, down to zero. Well, how do honeybees bring back that pollen? So here is uh, the segment of the hind leg where there is a sac. And so when I was in Ukraine last year, I took this photo here, and you can see the orange pollen there in the, on the leg as the bee is collecting it from this flower. And here is an easier uh, one to see where that sac is crammed full of yellow pollen. Well, pollen is their protein source. Uh, you know, they use the nectar for sugar, but they need protein, so that's the reason for the pollen. Well, remember we said earlier about the vibration of the wings and the flowers releasing the pollen. Well, there's an electro electrostatic charge on, on the bee as it flies through. It, it, you know, it picks up electrostatic charge, and so the pollen springs onto the bees, the hair covering the bees. And so you see this example where the <laughs> bees really plastered with pollen. Well, it's another one of those things that is not a coincidence that pollen grains fit very nicely in the spaces between the hairs on the bee's body. The, the hairs on the bee's body are spaced so that the pollen fits between the hairs. All right? And then the bees have these combs on their legs. So then they use the combs on their legs to comb out the pollen and stuff it into the sacs on their legs. All right? So there you see the bee in the act of combing the pollen off its back, you know, reaching way back there like so. So here is a bee fully loaded. <laughs> and has bonus load in the pollen that sticks to the hair on the legs. So maximum plus load. So what do they do with this pollen when they get to the hive? They empty it out and put it into cells that are separate from the cells that the nectar goes into. And then as the cells get complete, notice it's separated by color. And so then as the cells are then filled up, then they cap the cell and protect it so that nothing will get in there. Well, how do they bring back nectar to the hive? Well, you see there with the green, the alimentary canal, the GI tract of the bee. And so at the very front is the sucking pump that's used to extract the uh, nectar. And then there's this long esophagus, and then there is what's called a honey stomach in terms of common speech, but the preferred term is communal stomach, because that is where the nectar is then uh, transported as the bee then flies back to the hive. And so here you see that pump in action, where the bee is actually extracting the nectar. 
and then it is placed into the cells uh, where then the bees will attach themselves with their claws to, at the entrance of the hive and fan, so they're flying in place, to move air through the hive to evaporate the excess water from the nectar, converting it into honey. Then, when it is finished uh, being uh, concentrated, they uh, produce wax and cap it over for storage. Now, one gallon of water weighs eight pounds. One gallon of honey weighs 12 pounds. So this shows you that, that honey is half again more concentrated than nectar. Well, this wax, where does it come from? Well, I, being an organic chemistry teacher, I just got to give you a little bit of this here. Uh, this is what's called a long chain carboxylic acid because of that COO great, uh, OOH group in the box. And this is a long chain alcohol with the OH group in that little box. And so the gland puts the two molecules together, extracts a hydrogen from one, a hydroxyl group from the other, taking, removing one molecule of water, and now you have this super big molecule. That is wax. And that's, every kind of wax has this very same chemistry, whether it's car wax or any other kind of wax. So these are the glands on the underside of the bee's abdomen that produce this wax. And they have to eat collectively nine pounds of honey in order to make one pound of beeswax. Okay, so that's a tremendous amount of material that's necessary. But your majesty, what's the point of being busy bees if the so-called beekeeper always steals our honey? <laughs> Well, another issue bees have to deal with, uh, not so much here, although on some days uh, possibly so, but certainly in the southwest where we live, where it's, not, it's common in the summer to get 115, 116 degrees. Uh, and one year in Phoenix, we even had 123, June of 1990. So how do bees deal with this heat? Well, they go to your favorite pond or fountain, irrigation ditch, swimming pool, and put water in their communal stomach, fly back to the hive, deposit the water in the hive, attach themselves to the entrance, and fan to, evap to move that water through like an evaporative cooler and cool down the hive. I wonder how they figured that out. Well, I just showed you some stuff regarding the tremendous amount of work needed to produce honey, so I'm going to give you some gory details. I found this cartoon here. If bees earn minimum wage, a jar of honey would cost 182,000 bucks. I tried very hard to find the date that this cartoon was written because it's out of date. So here's some accurate numbers that are currently uh, appropriate. It takes 556 worker bees flying at top speed of 15 miles per hour. Total amount of miles flown, 4,600. Two million flowers visited. 12.5 seconds per flower. 310 hours of flight time. 7,000 hours spent just imbibing the nectar. Nine pounds of honey to produce one pound of comb. Work of evaporation, cooling, guarding the hive, human labor, and reproduction excluded. So at Arizona minimum wage of $11 this year, $804,100 per pound for honey. Higher in some states. <laughs> All right. Well, what else is in that honey? because all I've talked about is removal of water, but I didn't tell you what the bees put in. Well, there are several different sets of glands in the bee's body, in the head and the thorax, that secrete things that go into the nectar, which then is deposited into the hive. And one of the things is an enzyme that breaks down sucrose. Sucrose is the sugar that comes from sugar beets, sugar cane. Say your table sugar. 
All right, well, it's one of the sugars in nectar. It's also called invertase, uh, sucrase, the names for this enzyme. That's a picture of the enzyme. That is a protein molecule. Look how complex that is. It has many, many hundreds of amino acids in it. So the job of that protein is then to split the two parts of the sucrose apart, one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose, fruit sugar. Alrighty. Well, uh, this is uh, an acid here that is put into the honey and it lowers the pH. It makes it more acidic to make it antibacterial. The bees also secrete hydrogen peroxide. And you know that we use that in wounds in diluted form to, to kill bacteria. So isn't it interesting that they put in acid hydrogen peroxide uh, as well as the enzyme to, to break down the sugar. So the microorganisms are attacked if they get into the honey uh, by the hydrogen peroxide. So that's one set of glands. There's other set of glands here that make all of these things. All right. And I've grouped them by category of what they do. Okay, the ones here with this light blue box, they cleave off amino acids. In other words, they shorten proteins that are break down proteins that are in the nectar. Okay, the ones in yellow who break down more complex sugars, sugars that are longer than just uh, the sucrose. And then there's even one that breaks down fats. There's a very tiny amount of fat that's made by the plant in the nectar. And then here we have one that breaks down chitin. Who knows what chitin is? Anybody? Have you ever stepped on a beetle? Right. Chitin is what makes up the skeleton of crustaceans and beetles. You can see here one beetle got a little bit crunched there. Okay, so chitin is a polymer of this unit here, which is basically a sugar molecule with a few things hanging off of it in long, long chains of this very thing repeated, repeated, repeated. So this is what gives the exoskeletons of the beetles and the crustaceans very strong exoskeleton, external skeleton. Well, the enzyme that breaks this stuff down is secreted by the bees into the nectar. And you say, well, why is a bee worrying about beetles and crustaceans? Well, it's because there is a fungus that also has chitin in its uh, cell wall. And that fungus grows on things like wheat. And then that fungus can blow into, onto flowers and get into the nectar. So that's why God gave the bees the ability to make the molecule that breaks down the fungus so that the fungus cannot grow in the honey. Isn't that amazing? Well, bees do have a problem with these uh, parasites. Uh, called the Varroa destructor mite, and these, this reddish oval is the mite growing on the bee. Here are two bees that are infested with these mites, and these mites also love to eat the larvae of the bees, while well, these baby bees that are growing before they're ready to hatch out and become adult bees. Well, fortunately, we do have a way of combating this because these, these uh, mites will destroy and empty out a colony and, and kill it totally in months, if not treated. Uh, there's a stuff called apistan, which uh, kills the mites. Well, how, honeybee, how do honeybees deal with another problem? Predators in the form of robbers, other insects that want to rob. So here's a wasp. And so the honeybees are forming a ball. They're balling the wasp. And that white color was showing the increase in heat. And so they cook the wasp. All right. Now here's the amazing thing. The wasp will die in the range of somewhere between 10, 110, 116 degrees. Asian honeybees will die at 123, European honeybees at 125 degrees. So they know how to cook up to a certain temperature and stop so they don't kill themselves. 
Now they don't carry around thermometers, right, like we do, but they can sense the correct temperature. Isn't this absolutely astounding? Well, there's another special uh, secretion from the head, glands in the forehead, that maybe you've heard of royal jelly. All right, well, this is used to feed an egg that has been fertilized so that it will become a queen rather than a worker. The workers are female. The queen, obviously by name, is a female. And the drones are male. Guess who does all the work? The females. So here you see uh, letter A would be the larva of a worker, B the cell of a queen, two of them, C are the larger cells for the drones because they're larger than the workers, and then D is an egg that's going to be a worker. How do I know that? Because it's the right size cell for a worker rather than for a drone. So as the colony multiplies and it does well and the population increases, they can get ready to swarm, split, and send out a new colony. And so when it's time, the queen decides, okay, she's going to fly out, she'll land on a temporary place like a tree, and she has chemicals she produces called pheromones, and so the other workers come with her. Uh, they know how many should go with, how many should stay. And then they find scouts go out and find a permanent home, and then they fly off to that site. Unfortunately, sometimes it's in an opening under the eave of your home uh, from time to time. So here is a queen who has grown and is hatched out, and now she is going to go around looking for other queen cells, rip them open, and sting them so that she will not have any competitors. The phrase queen bee, there it is. All right. And so now she's out there uh, ready to, uh, well, in a moment, I'll get to that. But here, here's a queen who's laying eggs and she uh, inspects the cells before laying the eggs. Now, she can sting because she has no barb on her stinger, so she doesn't lose her stinger and rip out her guts. The workers, however, do have a barb on the end of their stinger, which many of you may know from personal experience. And so then, then that pulls out, then they'll die because they lose too many of their organs as the stinger remains behind. By the way, just so you know, if you don't already, the best way to get rid of a stinger is you take something like a credit card or something like that and you scrape. Never try to grasp the stinger because what you'll do is grab the poison sack and push the poison into yourself. All right. So this bee sacrificed herself in defense of the hive. And so why are you here? I was provoked and stung something. Hey, me too. <laughs> Be heaven. <laughs> Alrighty. So I mentioned that the queen flies off with the workers to form a new hive. Well, then the other queen left who hatches out now needs to fly off and she needs to mate. So here is a phenomenal photograph of a queen being mated by a drone in flight. Now they do this about a mile above the surface. And the drones from different hives will, will fly and collect in various zones, drone collecting zones. And the queen will mate with multiple drones, maybe only as many as five, maybe as many as 40. All right. And so the next drone to come along will pull out, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, when the drone mates with the queen, his organ of copulation remains in her with the sac, sperm sac, to be pumped into her, and his guts get ripped out and he goes out in a blaze of glory. So, <laughs> so what does the next drone do who comes along? He pulls out the previous organ of copulation and then does his thing. So this may happen multiple times. So this way the queen has multiple sources of sperm with different DNA for hardiness in the hive. So the queen then comes back to the uh, hive after the mating flight and then she, she is an egg-laying machine. That is her one and only job. 
So she inspects the cell that the workers have cleaned out, make sure it's clean to her satisfaction, which you see is what is going on here. Then she places her abdomen into the cell and deposits a fertilized egg. Female eggs are fertilized. Uh, the egg in the cell that is drone-sized cell, she will not fertilize. So the drones have half of the chromosomal material than the females have. So here you see individual eggs in each cell. And then here uh, you see the difference between the worker size cell and the drone cell and the queen cell. Again, the very different size cells there. So the queen will develop in 16 days. The workers in 21 days. I think the queen is faster because she gets the royal jelly, which makes her bigger, faster, stronger, quicker, higher, etc. And the drones, 24 days to uh, develop and hatch out. So here you see that the workers have twice as much genetic material as the males do the drones. Well, the only job of the drone is to mate with the queen. They do nothing else. They do no gathering of honey or nectar. And they get fed by the workers until fall arrives. It's the end of honey production time. And the female workers unceremoniously kick out all the drones. And, and they get to starve to death outside the hive. <laughs> so the guys can either go out in a blaze of glory quickly or they can starve to death slowly. Those are their two choices. All right. Well, from scripture, we hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, to settle down and earn the food they eat. So this is the story for the drones. They don't earn the food they eat. So that's their lot. Your Majesty, Your Majesty, the workers are discussing the possibility of forming a trade union. Revolt. Well, the word honey appears in Scripture 61 times. Reference to a land flowing with milk and honey occurs 21 times. So here's a riddle from Scripture, which you may be familiar with, in Judges. So he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Now, for three days they could not explain the riddle. Who knows the riddle solution? Yes? Samson. Samson, that's right. And what happened? You killed a lion. You had to yeah, Delilah bugged him to death. <laughs> literally, and in the long run. And they got the answer from her, and then they solved the riddle, and he lost the bet, and then he did the thing with the temple, and then down it came, and just you know, problems all over the place. Moral of the story is don't tell your wife a secret. <laughs> My wife is smiling over here, so. <laughs> but shaking her head. Okay, I'm in trouble. All right. So here is an artist's rendition of this skull of the lion with the bees inside of it. And to give proper credit, it was from this uh, record uh, album uh, called Earth. Well, let's talk about medicinal honey. I mentioned these antibacterial actions, the hydrogen peroxide, you know, directly uh, will kill bacteria. The acidity with the glucuronic acid that's placed into it, the hyperviscosity because it's so thick, viscous thick, that, you know, stuff can't physically penetrate it. Uh, it has high osmolarity. This means it has all this, these huge numbers of molecules of sugar, and what they do is if uh, in contact with water, they'll draw water to uh, become in equilibrium with where the water is coming from. And so there is a low water content in the honey. Well, so if you have a bacteria that's in contact with the honey, the honey is going to draw the water out of the bacteria and dehydrate it and kill it. And it's also this physical barrier to the microbes because of the viscosity. So there is now being used in modern medicine a particular honey from a plant called the Manuka plant and it's applied as a dressing over wounds 
And with these antibacterial properties and with this viscosity and the osmolarity, it draws fluid out of the wound and does a lot to speed up healing and prevent new infection and help fight infection that may be in the wound already. And it stimulates monocytes. Monocytes are a particular type of cell in our immune system. So watch as a thorn enters the wound, makes a wound. I'll show it here. Here's the thorn coming in, making a wound. So now bacteria have been introduced into the wound. And so now these monocytes that are in the blood are now going to leave the blood and go into the tissues to go where the problem is. And here you see this business with this kind of motion like amoeba, amoeboid motion, so they can move through among the cells and the tissues. And then uh, they secrete this thing called tumor necrosis factor alpha, which stimulates um, other cells to come and to fight infection. And then there's this molecule B defensin 1, which is put in the nectar by the bees. And that helps stimulate the production of molecules from skin cells, keratinocytes, skin cells, to migrate and wound the close, uh, close the wound sooner in both infected and non-infected wounds. All this stuff is amazing how this got there. This should blow you away. And so this antibacterial activity of honey against bacteria, against many different types of bacteria with these various health problems, uh, here, uh, I'll just mention, uh, well, I'll just show you these here uh, without going through all of them in particular. Uh, serious infections here that can be helped with honey. There's another particular type of plant called the ulmo plant, which grows uh, uh, here in uh, this region in southern uh, Chile. And it has special properties against methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, as you know it. It's an amazing thing. And it also produces, say again? It also produces hydrogen peroxide as well. So this is a, a wound that has that kind of infection. Put this Umo honey on it and it has a much better chance of successfully healing and clearing up the infection. Other types of infection that do better with uh, the honey as a treatment, I'll just mention the bottom one, H. pylori is Helicobacter pylori, which um, some of you may know is what is responsible for stomach gastric pyloric ulcers. And this Manuka honey is specifically good for that type of infection. And this is found in these uh, regions in uh, us, uh, Austria, uh, New Zealand where you see these tiny little dots. I don't know how well they show up on the screen there. And the uh, particular molecules that are put into the nectar by the plant. And so there's a, a micrograph showing the Helicobacter pylori. And so they invade the tissue and erode the lining of the stomach and cause this kind of thing to happen, where they erode into a blood vessel and cause a bleeding ulcer. Okay. So then ask yourself this question. How is it that this multitude of enzymes and antibacterial and antifungal agents come to be in honey by way of secretions from several glands in the bodies of the worker honeybees? Is it a series of random chance events or is it careful design by the omniscient, all-powerful creator of the universe and everything that is in it? Clearly the second. So, amber is in worldwide distribution. I gave you history in Northeastern Europe. Ecological zones of entrapped organisms, uh, very different zones that normally would not be found together. A mechanism of formation being in water rather than exposed to oxygen and then being buried. Evolutionary difficulty in assigning dates or mechanism. Dating headaches caused by bees, which you saw the, the honeycomb fossil 100 million years before it's supposed to be there. How bees can detect aromas, how they see, how they communicate transport nectar and pollen, process honey, reproduce individuals and colonies, and have these antibacterial and wound healing properties. So this is the original Gary Larson cartoon. It says, face it, Fred, we're lost. <laughs> but he made a big mistake. 
these are worker bees, they're females. So it should be, face it, Frederica, we're lost. <laughs> Yes, please. Does all honey have medicinal qualities? No, it has, all honey has a certain amount of antibacterial activity because it has the hydrogen peroxide, the, the, the acid, uh, but those two particular types have extra special properties for those two particular types of bacteria. Yes? Sinuses, that's interesting. Um, I don't think you could, the only thing you could do is ingest it. So, I, I, you would, it would be hard to try and get it into your sinuses. I don't think you want to try that. <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure. I think it's more meant for the topical wound application. Well, it would be um, pressure and time. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, uh, what's the process of hardening of, of uh, the resin into uh, amber? And it would be burial uh, pressure from layers of sediment. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, yes. It's amazing when you have so much more information like this, uh, how it changes your appreciation for the details in Scripture. Yes, sir. Well, a combination of these mites, insecticides, and uh, there may be a virus that's uh, doing its thing now. Yeah, because this is a national problem now. The, the, the uh, percentage of hives that are being decimated is becoming very significant. This is extremely important for agriculture, for pollination of uh, crops. Yeah, it's, it's, it could potentially become a real crisis in the near future. Now, is it true when they say if the bees die, we'll, are, we'll die too? That we would die? Yeah, I mean, the bees pollinate pretty much everything. Well, there would just be a lot less food available. Wow. Yeah. And then you get to do what the drones do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. It is possible, it's extremely labor intensive uh, to extract that from the glands that can It is done, it is marketed. I don't know if it, how much value there really is for a human being to have that, I can't speak to that, but yes, it is. There are commercial um, jars available. I mean, wouldn't it have to be exponentially expensive to be a quality product? It's very expensive stuff. No, 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 these jars are small. And for how much? Oh, I don't know. I've, I've had no desire to take it, so I don't know. <laughs> for it to be valid, would it even have to be more than $30 or something, right? I have no clue. Okay. I, I just can't say. Okay. I mean, there's not that much oil jelly around to begin with, right? Uh, no, it, it, no, and it would be very labor intensive to extract it from the glands. Correct. And the question was, does all the amber come from tree sap? And the answer is yes. Yes, sir. Is there some model of why the amber was deposited in certain areas? Is it just 
currents and floods? Oh yeah, you have to remember that the flood was a giant washing machine, mixing everything up, up, down, sideways, inside out, and and there were huge currents and things would just get deposited in certain areas, just like minerals would get deposited in certain areas. Uh, you know, I would, except for the horrendous thing of seeing millions or possibly billions of people die, I'd love to see a video of the flood to see what actually happened. You know. So. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a very common uh, saying among folks that if you uh, take the local honey, it'll help you with the allergies that you're allergic to locally. Don't know how really effective that is, but that's a very common thought. Okay. One more. One more question. One more. Last question. We're done. <laughs>